you all for coming back after lunch. I hope you're energized because uh, we expect this to be a very another very interesting uh, panel uh, discussion. And uh, as you can see, we have a more sort of a comfortable and a different type of an orientation now. So thank you to the organizers for you know setting this up really quickly during lunchtime. So let me lay the context for this panel. Um, and I uh, <clears throat> would like all of you at some point in this discussion to also participate. Uh, listen carefully, we have a very esteemed panel here. This represents, the, what will be talked about today represents six years of an engagement of Government of India in four northeastern states uh, through the NERLP, the Northeast Rural Livelihood Project. And it just so happens that the World Bank has been in collaboration with the Government of India in helping design and implement this project. So what you will hear today is from <coughs> Sambodhi uh, and Swapnil Shekhar, I'll introduce him in a minute, is a rigorous impact evaluation. We believe it is the first ever for the region of the Northeast uh, in, in the sector uh, where uh, right from the methods side to the programmatic results to the outcomes, all of that will be explained very shortly. So uh, I will introduce the panelists as we move forward in the panel discussion. Let me first just introduce Swapnil Shekhar. Chief Operating Officer of Sambodhi. Swapnil Shekhar has championed the cause of evidence-based policy and decision making and is a leading practitioner in the country of cutting edge and innovation fuel research and monitoring learning and evaluation techniques. He has worked with clientele across the development sector on value chain ranging from on, across the development sector value chain ranging from grassroots organizations <coughs> NGOs, both national and international foundations, multilaterals, bilaterals, government agency. Swapnil is a Rockefeller Foundation Global Fellow. Uh, we welcome Swapnil and uh, please take the floor and enlighten us with the, you know, the design and the results of NERLP. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Swapnil uh, and thank you, Preeti, for the introduction. I have 15 minutes and I have around 15 slides to talk about. I'll, I'll give, a, give, a, give a brief on what NRELP is, uh, overall uh, project structure, and then we'll dive into methodology and findings. So the way we have structured the presentation, we have, we'll spend first couple of minutes on the structure of the project and then methodology. Uh, to start with, uh, this is the overview slide on NERLPS, and it is composed of around five strategic focus areas. And the so, uh, these are social empowerment, economic empowerment, partnership development, livelihood model value chain development, and project management. The, but the core of it is community mobilization, as we all know. So SHGs, along with uh, uh, producer groups, producer organizations, and uh, the, you know, one innovative uh, piece that uh, NERLP brings in uh, the ecosystem is the community development groups. And this is a very large group com comprising of all the households within a particular catchment. So commissioned in 2011, uh, the, it, the program intends to improve rural livelihoods, especially that of women, unemployed youth, and the most disadvantaged in four northeastern states. Until date, it has reached out to, it has mobilized around 28,000 women uh, in SAGs in four focus states in 1,645 villages and 58 blocks. I'll give a very brief on uh, the theory of change uh, for the implementation and the, and, the, and the evaluation was essentially based on core pieces of the theory of change. So if you look at the theory of change, the first block talks about social mobilization creation uh, and creation of market linkage. So this entails bucket of activities around crea creating social organizations, SHGs, federations, CDGs. And second is, which is much more market focused, it looks at input and output market linkages, it looks at creating community infrastructure to support market. The immediate, out, immediate outcome that the, the program, the, the, the evaluation intends to measure is diversified and upscale livelihood activities, both off farm and on farm, including agriculture, fishery, livestock, and enterprises. This leading to improved household income. One of the separate component of the intervention is youth. For today's purpose, we are not covering youth. It is essentially focused on the community mobilization through SAGs and other similar community institutions. 
uh, coming to the methodology, this is the slide that we have on methodology. We'll, we'll take questions as well later, but for, for now, uh, the, the, four, the three key overarching questions that we respond to through this evaluation are, what is the effect of program in improving key outcomes? Have the target outcomes been achieved? Second is, did the program have differential impacts on different subsamples of interest? And the third is, what are the reasons for attainment or non-attainment of, object, uh, of objectives? Um, the design that we had used for this evaluation is a, a matched counterfactual design, a mixed method, using a propensity score matching method to match treatment and comparison. The pre-intervention variables that were used uh, are, are varied variables, including caste, gender, religion, other time invariant household characteristics. Uh, let me spend a minute on the challenges that we uh, uh, encountered during the design and execution of the evaluation. First was essentially absence of a baseline. This project got started in 2011, and we didn't, didn't have a baseline to actually do a, a double difference calculation, so to say. And this was a major challenge, a major hindrance. Uh, we explored many options to create or to understand the baseline characteristics, but it were far and few. Uh, identification of comparison, it was a, a challenge uh, owing to the fact that you don't find areas where you don't have livelihood interventions. So we have opted for areas where uh, you don't have, uh, or non-intensive uh, areas where you don't have any livelihood interventions either from government or from any other agency. Uh, the study covered uh, eight districts uh, uh, in project area, 16 districts in non-project area. We surveyed around 6,733 households, uh, which, which comprised of treatment and comparison. In project area, we covered around 3,296 households. We also interviewed SHGs uh, through the project area, around 600 SHGs were interviewed. Uh, uh, the fact, uh, uh, the reason why we chose SHGs, and we had subsamples of uh, other target groups as well, like the producer group, uh, the CDGs, etc. Uh, we, I'll, I'll jump onto the uh, impacts. The first impact uh, that we talk about is the income impacts. Uh, so we had uh, um, the the the, um, the the results framework document of the World Bank states a, a PDO which we'll talk about later, but before getting to PDO, let's create a narrative around how income in impacts have uh, moved through the project period. Uh, the first uh, impact, what we talk about, is the population level impact on household income. We see that if you look at the average treatment effect on household income due to project, using propensity score matching, we find that project uh, households have an average income increase of around 18%, precisely 17.8%, as compared to households in the non-project areas. This is the first population level impact on income that we are talking about. We further analyzed into what are the factors that led to this impact. One of the chief factors that led to this impact is, of course, presence of SHG. So one's presence in SHG or non-SHG. The SHG households, if you see, have more for 14% more income than non-SHG households. So this is one of the chief triggers of income enhancement. Other contributors that we saw when we actually deep dived into data, one was definitely with every loan that an SAG receives, you, the, the propensity of an SAG to garner more income increases. So, if you, so the first point that comes under it is that with every loan received, households have experienced a significant increase in income, and that, is, that amounts to around 15,734. Besides loan, uh, diversification and upscaling and also linkage to input and output markets have contributed to income increase. The results are not significant though. Uh, the, second, the second slide on income talks about whether the project, the intervention, has been able to achieve the, uh, the PDO of, of, of the intervention or not. The PDO states that at least 60% of SAG households achieve a minimum of 30% increase in, in real income uh, by the end of the project. So if you look at the, the level of achievement that uh, the project has led to, it, it is falling a bit short on achieving the PDO. It says that around 51% of project SAG households have experienced an increase in income of 30% of or more. So we have further uh, analyzed why this has happened or why, why not this has happened. But before we get there, one of the important, uh, uh, what do you call it, 
the, the, the soul of the project was including the poorest of the poor. So further, we uh, distributed the data into Decile and understood and tried to understand who are the guys who have actually secured more income. And if you look at the distribution, the, and the, the, four, the first four uh, uh, income deciles have, uh, we can see that concentration of income change is more in that. So 20.4% of poor households have experienced an income increase of around 30% of more. So this is something that we, we uh, see as uh, reaching out to the agenda of inclusion when it comes to the project. We move to the results slide because the results uh, will help us understand the PDO better and how it has missed on or how it has achieved or how much it has achieved the project objective. Uh, talking about the social parameters, uh, we have to understand the data here in the context of the, of the Northeast and also the fact that we are talking about four uh, uh, states which are geographically very well spread off and, and the difficult territories to work in. So for, when you talk about social parameters, uh, if you see that mobilization under SHG, so 88% of SHG women in the project area are first time members of SHG. So these are, the, these are newly included members in SHG ecosystem. 86% uh, of them belong to vulnerable and marginalized people. So more than the classical definition of marginalized and vulnerable in case of Northeast, geographical inclusion or exclusion becomes the bigger challenge here. So when we talk about uh, this kind of, uh, uh, what you call it, reach when it comes to uh, inclusion, we are talking about a geographically agnostic finding. So it is a secular finding. It is across all the four states. Majority of the design elements, including loans, CDP uh, usage, vocational training, have benefited the, the marginalized population. We also try to analyze health of SHGs using the classical parameters that is usually uh, undertaken for, for uh, appreciating health of SHGs. Majority of SHGs have been training, have received training on uh, organizational management, on bookkeeping, etc. Et and, and most of them classify into the grade A. Access to loan, uh, uh, and when we talk about community mobilization, the next step we intend to understand is whether this is leading to any kind of uh, energy around access to credit linkages and, of course, enterprise. Uh, the positive story here is that 94% of SHGs in the, in, in the ecosystem have, at, have received at least two livelihood funds. 63% have taken at least one loan and 91% of them have paid back the livelihood loans that they have taken. And, and the benefits are ubiquitous in nature beyond the loan that they have taken. It, they have invested the loan in several other uh, spheres of uh, economy, and which includes uh, upscaling their activity, diversification, uh, acceptance of a new technology. This, this entire uh, story should be understood on the fact that supply side parameters in, North, in the Northeast are, cannot be compared with what we see otherwise. So you have very poor, uh, uh, what you call it, reach of microfinance institutions, a poor reach of uh, banks. So in, that, in this situation, when you see that 18% of SHGs have been credit linked, uh, the, the numbers seem high. 52% of SHG have supported by the project are institutionally sustainable. Federation is again the next level of uh, driver for, for an investment like this. Uh, federation, we have we've studied many federations through the study process. Federations have, uh, have uh, bright spots, federations have uh, pitfalls as well. But our, our study shows that they have a vibrant set of uh, federations that we have. Federating started in the year 2015. And you have most of, most of the federations are very active. They have dynamic uh, committees, subcommittees, which are, which, are, which are functioning on the behalf of the federation. Capacities, in investment on further capacity building on federation is something that we, we, we have recommended through the study. We, we believe that organization development per se of uh, the federations needs to be invested upon more. Many of, there are many anecdotal and case studies that we have developed through the, through the data collection period where we talk about how federations have not only uh, contributed to essentially their core job description, but they have moved up and contributed to something like a community development plan development or any other village level activity. 
uh, we had a, a module on understanding how women empowerment or how SHG or community mobilization have impacted uh, a few of the women empowerment indicators that we measured. One, and and we, we understood that when we talk about mobility, we see positive story around mobility. 75% uh, of SHG uh, have reported enhanced, SHG women members essentially, have reported enhanced uh, mobility. 60% uh, or more than 60% of them have also reported increased role in intra-household decision making and contribution in income and livelihood activities. Livelihood, there was a very strong focus of the project on creating an enabling environment in, 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 on, in livelihood. So connecting to input and market in, input, uh, uh, creating market uh, um, linkages, connecting to different partner agencies in the livelihood sp space along the value chain, whether it be uh, seed companies, whether, whether it be marketing companies. So if you look at the numbers that the survey present, 34% of households have adopted improved farm and non-farm technologies. Then the next level of analysis was on whether they have in diversified or intensified the activities on which they had re received training on package of pra practices. Around half of them have reported they have diversified or upscaled their activities. Output and input market linkages, while it started quite late in the day when it comes to project intervention timeline, we see early impacts of around sort of one fourth of the household reporting that they have been connected to either input or output market. For now, concentration on input linkages is found to be more than output linkages and that is something that we have also recommended in the in, 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 in our report to be reinforced upon one one point that I missed was uh, if you look at the partnerships that are developed at this stage these are more produced production centered partnership they're not market centered partnership so this this story has to move more towards market center partnership because if you have enabled community organizations the next level of a change would happen only when a very strong market linkage established through market market led actors uh, being key on the partnerships a uh, cdp uh, i spent a couple of uh, more minutes on cdp i think i have around 40 seconds uh, 50 seconds more yeah so that's why i wanted to spend some time on cdp so cdp is the uniqueness of this uh, mandate uh, cdp in fact starts from creating a, a community development group in a village when, when an intervention starts every household of a village is requested to participate in a community level group which would have representation for uh, from all the households and they would work towards creating a community development plan community development plan is essentially a community level infrastructure uh, which is created for uh, for enhancing livelihoods in that area it can it, it can be of several types so uh, it can be of several types. Uh, one of it is definitely uh, what, what we saw here is uh, market sheds. What we saw here is what, water related activity, soil and moisture conservation activity. These are large scale activity which would have impact story at the community level, not at the household level. So if you look at the current state, uh, and here we, when we talk about the, when we get to the last slide, we'll also talk about when did we start on CDP. CDP is one of the largest investments when it comes to uh, the project. And CDP implementation started quite late in the day. And as of today, we have 68% of villages which have a C active CDP. Of the 68% of villages which have active CDP, you have 67% households which are you currently using the uh, CDP. And, the, and these CDPs, if you go to the field, you'll understand these are not matured CDP. They are yet to, yet, yet to attain their maturity when it comes to impact creation. 95% of CDP users have reported having been benefited using CDP. And these are uh, early findings on CDP because the impacts are yet to mature. I've talked briefly about the nature of, uh, of CDP. Mo most of them contribute to larger community level impacts. 45% of them were on water management. You would say, you would look at uh, market sheds as well. We have a small caselet on, on a milk collection center that was created in Sikkim. This this, uh, this was an uh, infrastructure that was created for collecting milk at a uh, village level. Because it found traction with, with the local milk cooperative, it has been very strongly located within the milk value chain of Sikkim now. So this is a case study that we have a full-fledged case study in the report as well. 
So uh, I, I'll, I'll have a couple of more minutes uh, uh, on, on the results, uh, on the way forward that we understand. Uh, when, we, when I talked about the fact that we missed, uh, the, the project missed uh, uh, the PDO marginally, uh, we also talked about the fact that how it is, uh, the project households are better off when it comes to income vis-a-vis -vis the comparison household. What, what uh, the, the results attainment story and, and the differential on income talks about is a compelling, compelling impact narrative on the fact that we are on the way towards uh, crystallizing the theory of change. Uh, we have an ab the project has an able, uh, has created a strong community institution, facilitated access to credit and provided handholding support. Working in a hard to reach geography and when you have very staggered implementation plan, this uh, story is incomplete lest we have a post project assessment done after say a couple of years. When we actually see actualization of benefits accrued by several infrastructure investments as well. The cue that it gives us for further uh, further investments on livelihood is how do you how do you balance between creating large scale or say community level infrastructure and creating strong community organization. So here the, the balance was something that we understood. CDP was based on uh, very strong community organizations, and the timing of it is something that we have to, have to understand better when it comes to livelihood constructs. Capacity development, we still need to invest, the project still needs to invest on capacitating the federations uh, beyond what it is right now. We, we talked a, a bit about how organizational, organizational capacity has to be enhanced for sustainability uh, on a sustainability standpoint. Uh, when we visited the field, CDPs, as uh, I've mentioned before, they are not yet mature when it comes to reali realizing, realizing impacts. We need to have better, better understanding of how you use of trucks have, will be defined in the future who would be responsible for ONM and uh, essentially the, uh, the protocols related to sustainability. This is something that uh, we have recommended to be worked upon. Engaging supply side, this, this is particularly true in context of the Northeast where you talk about microfinance, you talked about access to credit, you talked about talk about enterprise development. We need to uh, invest on supply side uh, one, awareness generation definitely, on, and also helping them understand the potential, the latent potential of the Northeast catchment. This is what uh, uh, I have for now. Yeah. Yeah. I hope the audience has taken away some nuggets in your minds that we will come back during discussion. Uh, I think you will appreciate, uh, you know, that uh, the Northeast has historically, uh, ha has I won't use the word suffered, that won't be appropriate, that has sort of been, uh, you know, encountered a development gap, so to speak, in terms of financing, in terms of efforts, could be due to its remote topography, uh, you know, due to a very diverse sort of uh, ethnic uh, cultural context there. Approaches have to be different, and I hope you all took one aspect, and that is what uh, set this project apart from other rural livelihood projects in India is that it had a community infrastructure component, some of which Swapnil referred to. So in about 1,100 plus very, very remote areas of the Northeast, communities themselves came together to do irrigation channels, lift irrigation, poly nurseries, market sheds, agri-link roads, a lot of that. And the, the rationale for that, in fact, came from the institution that my colleague, esteemed colleague to the right belongs to, uh, Rasha Omar, uh, uh, IFAD has been uh, engaging in the Northeast for many, many years, and uh, they have a NARCOM program. So when the Northeast was designed way back in 2011, uh, NERLP took into account some of the successes and the design lessons that we learned from the NARCOM program of IFAD. So uh, this sort of takes me to the panel, and uh, let me just quickly uh, introduce the panelists here very briefly. Uh, Rasha is the country director of IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and she's also the head of the South Asia Sub-Regional Hub for IFAD. She's based in New Delhi. Uh, by training, she's an agricultural economist and has been involved very deeply in this area since uh, 1992. Uh, to my left is uh, the former chief secretary of uh, the government of Sikkim, uh, Mr. Alok Srivastava. And he is, uh, needless to say, a very senior uh, IS officer of the 1984 batch of Sikkim Kader. 
And I won't go into details, he's got a very sort of uh, uh, huge uh, thing, but he's also, he's, a, he's an author, he's written books, and he's been with various departments, needless to say, of Government of India. And we're very, very privileged to have Mr. Srivastava with us. We also have with us uh, a person from the Niti Aayog, an official from the Niti Aayog, and we're very happy to have them because Niti Aayog has, uh, you know, plays a very important role from the policy perspective in terms of their interface with central ministries, state governments, on planning, on financing, and so forth. So we were very keen to uh, have somebody from there. We have Mr. Kabilan. He is an officer of the Indian Defense Account Service 2005 batch. He's presently uh, at a central government deputation as director in the Niti Aayog, looking after the Northeast states. And uh, uh, he has a lot of experience. And uh, during lunch, he told me he knows a lot about the Northeast in terms of his work in every state of the Northeast. So we have in the panel, I want to let you know that the Northeast is so unique. It's so different from the other states of India that if somebody has to give remarks and respond to the Northeast, you have to know the Northeast. You have to have lived in the Northeast and embraced you know, the culture and the ethnic context and the people and the communities and the state governments and their perspectives. And we have just the right people to be able to do that. So let's open up this panel. And we will now give, uh, starting from Rasha, then moving on to Mr. Kabilan and then Mr. Srivastava, about five minutes each to give their reactions. Uh, based, of course, on their experiences in the Northeast, their engagement, but also what they heard, you know, does it gel with what you know about rural livelihoods and agriculture programs more generally? Thank you very much, uh, Preeti, and uh, Happy New Year to all, and wishing you a very uh, fulfilling year ahead. Um, <clears throat> so thank you very much to Swapnit for an excellent study uh, by the Sambodi team, and I believe also in cooperation with the NetFi team. Uh, and I'd like to, I also was pretty struck by that collaboration. And it can also set um, new opportunities for the future. Uh, my uh, initial reaction uh, to the uh, assessment uh, that was done is like pretty mentioned earlier, it's very rigorous. Uh, and it also uh, confirms again that uh, empowering women is good for the household, uh, good for the village economy and good for the wider uh, economy. So the link between women empowerment and economic development as well as poverty reduction is very, very clear in the uh, results coming out from the, uh, from the study. Uh, I also felt uh, reading the study that there was uh, really a big evolution in the approaches uh, to financial inclusion and uh, community empowerment in the Northeast region. So uh, when we had uh, started with the Northeast Council uh, back in the late 1990s, it was very much a community-driven development uh, approach. Uh, by uh, mid-2000s, there was a strong linkage between livelihoods and natural uh, resource management, uh, whereby the, uh, similar to the community uh, development groups, the natural resource management groups would really take care of the natural resources of their village and improve the productivity of these natural resources and also be a platform for women and men to contribute uh, together, which was not really possible within the traditional village institutions um, in the areas where we operated, which were Meghalaya, Assam, and uh, Manipur. Uh, so these platforms of community, uh, at the initial time it was natural resource management groups, transformed later on as community development groups really create that platform for women engagement at uh, community level. And of course, the link with the self-help groups is to strengthen both the livelihood aspect and the economic aspect and um, reinforce or uh, add value to the investments in natural resources that are happening. I can see now that there's a third, um, if you want, generation which is focusing much more on the uh, community development works and it makes a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> because if we want to move the livelihoods uh, forward, it's very important to have a vibrant production base. And it was very interesting to see that the bulk of it was actually into water in terms of community investments. Because water gets you two things. One is irrigation potential, and immediately you get at least 40% productivity increase. 
uh, and multiple uh, seasons, so that uh, boosts the volume that can de and the surplus that can be sold. But at the same time, it also reduces the drudgery of women who can invest more on their income generating activities. And as we've seen in the study, there's a lot of scaling up of the um, income generating activities that women engage in. So these actually, this double effect creates uh, also a, um, the fact that there's more production, more around the year, better productivity, surpluses, and uh, linkages to the markets become uh, possible. Uh, the, one of the things that struck me in the uh, study, which also show the, how much still, quite a lot is still needed, is that in many of the villages with, where NERLP was uh, operating, they're actually 30 to 40 kilometers away from the main city. So that again uh, stresses the importance of connectivity and converging between these livelihood uh, community development type projects uh, that can be supported by um, the states with uh, assistance from various development partners and also converging with the connectivity and infrastructure development projects uh, going on in, in the state. So that these hubs of um, vibrant economic uh, local economies can really expand and um, create a ripple effect in the uh, surrounding uh, areas. So I'll stop here and I bet get we'll have other opportunities also to discuss other aspects that perhaps the study could have uh, brought out. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Rasha. Let's go to Mr. Kabilan. I just want to uh, just check whether I'm right or not. Uh, Sambodhi is uh, literally, etymologically, it's full of knowledge and wisdom. Correct? Yes. So, because I, I, I'm a last minute addition, so I did some <coughs> R&D myself. Uh, so, I, I feel that uh, I'd gone through the report also. So, true to their name of the organization, there's a lot of methodological rigor it's data driven and I'm very, very happy that an organization has gone to this level of detail. So uh, these are my initial uh, uh, kind of impressions of this particular study. Uh, going uh, deep into the area because uh, he, uh, as uh, Preeti Ma'am has also said that Northeast is a, a kind of a different terrain. You have to kind of be there and experience Northeast per se. I got the good fortune to be posted there more than two or three times. So I worked in that region. So it's a very different uh, space to work with and it's challenging also. Coming back uh, to this study, as far as uh, I have gone into that, especially on the way forward front, we are working, uh, we in the sense from Niti Aayog as well as with donor, we are working on the way forward also on how to take this project next. Uh, NERLEP and uh, NERCOMP, and there is something else in the pipeline which is going to have a much more larger positive impact for the people of Northeast. Um, as far as uh, um, my personal inputs in this particular uh, study would be, uh, whenever we, we talk of especially uh, agricultural products, uh, as far as Northeast is concerned, if uh, somebody is working on that area, I feel that uh, it has to be integrated with the larger activist policy of the government of India. And uh, there are issues when we talk of, especially in export of agri, ag agri products, because uh, there is something called a Codex Alimentarius, which is the FAO standards for uh, uh, when you when you import some stuff from a, from X country to Y country. Uh, when, when India sends some kind of a product, especially a GRI or 40 product, so they say that it's not compliant to that particular regime. So when we, when we kind of structure these kind of interventions, we should uh, take those into consideration also because we'll have to integrate uh, Northeast to the, the larger uh, supply chain which is available, especially in the Southeast Asia. The other part of which uh, I personally want to do is like, uh, we need to find a way. This is a very, very good uh, uh, initiative. Uh, like a lot of people from the Northeast come over to the major cities in India in search of work. So we are working at Niti right now to find ways and means to kind of stop this economic migration. 
uh, establish hubs in northeast only so that people don't go in search of jobs or livelihood retain a sense of pride and uh, stay close to their roots and homes the other uh, important uh, thing which uh, is highlighted in the studies like this is extremely uh, data rich and which has helped policy also and uh, rather we would uh, help them to come over to Niti also to share their findings at some point of time. It will help us to shape future projects which we are, which are in the pipeline. Because when, when we deal uh, with some states, we ask them for report, they say that data is not there. And we say that the government of India is spending quite a lot of money. How can there not be any data? So we ask them that you have to give data because there are certain schemes where a lot of funding is there. We, we need to have that input. So when we have this kind of an uh, empirical evidence-based evaluation, there is a system of feedback which is very, very important for us. Because we sitting in the government, we, we want this kind of a feedback which is very enriching for us and a sense of satisfaction is also there. And the results in this particular study also show that there is almost 30% uh, <coughs> increase in income across households on a, on a whole. So that's very, very encouraging. 18 percent my bad so so this is a very very significant increase as far as uh, uh, this uh, uh, NERLEP is concerned as I said earlier there are a lot of projects which are coming uh, from the government of India and we would like to uh, engage uh, institutions like somebody World Bank is a repository of knowledge so we, we are very happy that uh, decisions uh, are driven by data and decisions are driven by kind of uh, measured impact. So that's what I would like to say. Thank you. Wow, those were very, very, two sets of very excellent comments. Uh, from Rasha, we heard more sort of her impressions on the results that came out and as it interfaced with IFAD's own engagement. Uh, the importance of natural resources management, the importance of bringing irrigation and water productivity to those remote areas. And she also spoke about regional connectivity because there's a lot of remoteness. I really love the comments from uh, Kabilan as well. I think they were very sort of the Niti Ayo comments, right? The kind we want to hear. Visionary uh, talks about their engagement with M donor, talks about their perspectives as they want uh, the Northeast to become a hub of growth and start tapping into integrated value chains and even looking at exports and the requirements that India needs to fulfill if it wants to export its agricultural commodities. So thanks a lot and I'm going to take his offer for actually taking the impact evaluation presentation to Niti uh, if, if we can do that, so that's excellent. We now have with us a very important person as equally important as Rasha and Kabilan, he is Mr. Srivastav. And the little secret here is he's the first project director he was of the Northeast Rural Livelihoods Project from the government of India had appointed him as the very first PD. So he's seen this project as it got designed, as it went to the World Bank's board for approval, and now he has just retired a month ago as Chief Secretary of a very important state in the Northeast Sikkim. And uh, you know, so it's, it's gonna be lovely to hear Dr. Srivastav yourself. And uh, he's promised me that he will speak for about four or five minutes first, and then we'll come back to another round of uh, your know, remarks and perspectives. So over to you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, the college debates when there were, you know, restrictions. <laughs> and I never made it, but those who made it, they were left behind and we came to Delhi to the same JNU which is in the roll drums. And uh, let me tell you two things I always say. I'm from arts background. Because in our days, if you are a science student, you are very important. So they will just ask us, oh, you are reading arts. So I made it much ahead of them. Secondly, I'm from Hindi medium, but I do try to speak in English. Number one, Happy New Year to all of you. Number two, thanks to Ms. Preeti and Mr. Varun Singh, my old friends in World Bank, for inviting me. Uh, Ms. Uh, P. Kumar, who is the agriculture, senior agriculture scientist, she has taken a lot of uh, uh, initiative for this, 
And on this occasion, since he spoke about my old background, I am reminded of our old friend, philosopher, and guide, Mr. Nathan Belite, who is no longer here. And it was a fun to work with him. And let me tell you what, what, what Preeti did not tell you. It's a secret, because somebody talked about secrecy of data. This is also a secret that I worked with World Bank or related to this project when I was not even appointed. And it was more than one year, let me tell you. But I saw to it that project comes to seize the day of the light. Now, since he has said that you have to speak twice, five minutes and four minutes, it's a blessing in disguise, as well as it's a, it's a kind of a, a burden on my shoulders. First and foremost, let me tell you, I wanted to tell you at, about the beginnings of what is called poverty. What we read in the school textbooks was, it started with food for work. So many of you are not even born when in 50s it was started, no monetary component. Later on it was IRDP, which was started, continued for quite some time, but didn't meet the success which it was aiming for. And you had three doses of financing, what was known as the loan component, as opposed to the grant component of the NERLP. And of course, you have the second or third dose here also, but I could not see that part, and uh, well, I had to leave the project. But that part, I don't want to say. I think Prithi and others should analyze that. Also, we had, why only cash? Why only you know, grant or loan? Why can't you go only for employment? So we had RLEGP, we had NERP, NREP, and we had JRY. Somebody spoke about SGSY today. I don't want to comment on that. That also failed slightly miserably. I think uh, Kavilani is here. He should take note of that. Now, if you talk of project in general, from my side, NERLP started in second week of December 2009. From their side, it started sometimes in 2012. And we tried our level best that we should have, you know, we should have the end of pre-feasibility, feasibility, and blah, 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 blah. Those Englishes, I won't understand because I was in the middle of my career. But now I understand it much better. And what happened? You get two lakhs of money, two lakhs of rupees for starting the project. That is something Preeti may not be knowing. Two lakhs and two months. Two months, two lakhs, and in this age of 2020, two, 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 two. And how many employees to support? Three or four. So I got my first salary after three months or so. Never mind, Bharat Mata Jindabad, that was the spirit. And we began with 2,000 rupees rent. Then we went, the fellow said, oh, World Bank. So you give us 4,000. I said, fine. When, when you are, when you have 6,000, then we, then we went to get another office. So these are the things, but let me tell you, the spirit, since he is reminding me, let me tell you, the spirit never died. Then you see, what happens is that, despite all the care which was taken in identification of trade or activity and the SSGs, the difference between absolute poverty and relative poverty is hardly understood in our country. The, 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 the relative poverty will be always there. Absolute poverty, you know, how do you define it? Whether in terms of income or whether in terms of calorie. Now, in the identified beneficiary is absolutely poor. So by support of bank finance, he has to be lifted. That is in IRDP. But in case of any RRP, you have what is called, what is called, uh, 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 you have grant. And grant is not to the individual, but it is to the SSGs. As far as lessons are learned, I'll quickly go through, since there is time restriction, SSGs have got, have, have gained in popularity for the social and economic empowerment. Number two, the CDGs have also proven to be significant. Number three, village level federations have been reported to be functioning well. And the federations, there are, these are executing CD plans or livelihood infrastructure projects also. For example, projects for the non-privileged children and projects for uh, marrying of the daughters of the, of the uh, what shall I say, uh, poor people. Going by these broad conclusions, the present mode of NREP needs to be readopted if the next phase of the project is taken up 
either in left out districts of four states of the Northeast or in three remaining states of Northeast, that is Assam, Meghalaya, and Manipura. Manipur, something World Bank uh, should be reminded of. Because when we started, we started with eight states. Then we found that China is objecting. So our natural is out of question. So we went for two phases. Now let us remind ourselves there is something called second phase also. And of course, the regional uh, aspirations and specific situations may have to be taken into account as usual. Coming to Sikkim, I have got few points. Uh, very few points I would like to mention. Certain things I won't mention. I don't understand what is called in somebody's report interfusion. Number two, wage employment, it's, it's hardly an issue in our state because local people don't work. Women of Sikkim have lately emerged as leaders. They are not only heading the SSGs, but also the Gram Panchayats, Jila Panchayats, educational institutions, and government departments. We have five or six lady secretaries in the, in the state. I may request the authors of the report to denote Rabangla as a subdivisional headquarter, not as a village. If my if construction of nine water tanks was taken up in Lexip Rambangla area, I feel it is waste of resources because it is a steep hill area. You should not go for tanks over there. It is extremely satisfying to know that repayment of livelihood funds is regular and that Sikkim has the highest credit linkage among the four project states. It is also heartening to note that majority of the SAGs are capable of sustaining even if funding comes to an end. Another village silver lining is 68% of the households have been in a position to increase their income and 60% households have adopted farm and non-farm technologies. Youth who have received training of different kind, 40% of them are already self-employed. Now, last but not the least, there are four clusters they have talked about, but I would like to lay stress only on two clusters. One is milk, another is vegetable. The vegetable cluster that the ladies you can see here, they are from an organization called uh, Sikkim Pragati Shield Nari Cooperative Society, Nandugaon. They have established themselves in 2017 and they are linked to 15,000 SSG members. Go and see their products which are displayed here. Apart from that, uh, one thing they have really done well is, you know, sabji, the vegetable which we need badly. And since we had organic, non-organic controversy now, we were earlier organic state, but right now we are silent. So right now the field is wide open. This is the time to exploit the scenario. In dairy, I will just mention one thing before I withdraw, because I know Preeti must be, uh, you know, uh, very, very angry with me. That is, that is the, the only place in the whole of Northeast you have forgotten is the Dentam cheese plant, which was started under Indo Swiss project. And I don't know where, where are the people from West Sikkim who have not even made a mention of it. And you know, this is selling world class Gouda cheese. Most of it is going to Europe thanks to Amul. And I was a player in that also. I'm grateful to uh, uh, you know, Priti that she has. Uh, uh, she has underlined, if not flagged, my contribution to the project. But let me tell you, I was, I was involved in Gouda cheese project also in 91, 92, or 92, 93. And go and see what all uh, wonders we have done. Now, one or two things. Please mention in this report, Mr. Sambodhi Swapnilji, the names of the officers who started this project from 2007, 2008 onwards, and people like me who were working without being, being relieved, without, without getting approval from so-called, quote unquote, appointment committee of government of India. This funda is here in Delhi. We will decide in Delhi and decide that you are not competent or not competent. This is the case. The second is that uh, uh, the some photographs you are saying, photographs are all from Mizoram or Nagaland. Where are the photographs from Sikkim, which has got better success story? And then, you see, excellent bank network, because it has been mentioned. I am I, I was chairman of SLBC, uh, uh, banker's body, for four and a half years. Let me tell you, I know what are the problems of banks. And we have done so well. That has not been mentioned. We are the best in connectivity as far as roads are concerned. The highest road density is in Sikkim. That has not been mentioned. 
and and there are there are so many other things but on the whole last sentence on the whole we have done well on the whole the project has done well my kudos my recommendations my congratulations not only to sambodhi but also to to world bank for having done this today i was told after so many years that now we have got 13 projects earlier we were listening about or going to tamil nadu andhra pradesh madhya pradesh bihar odisha and where not so these are the things these are the new challenges to development is moving from loan to what is called grant thank you